Hey viewers, welcome to the International Humanitarian Law. Today's topic is the famous known as the Martens Clause in the Laws of Armed Conflict. Martens Clause has already become a doctrine in the International Humanitarian Law or the laws of armed conflict, the Geneva laws. But what is Martin's clause? And what is the doctrine about it? This lecture is going to acknowledge the article written by one Rupert Tischerhurst. I beg your pardon for the pronouncement from the King's College School of Law in London. Let's first and foremost look at the doctrine and who is Martin. Professor von Martin from the Federation of Russia was one of the delegates in the Hague Peace Conference of 1899 and when the conference was facing some dispute concerning the status of civilians and what law should protect the civilian populations during the hostilities, this is the time Professor von Martin came up with the following declaration, quote, until a more complete code of the laws of war is issued, the high contracting parties think right to declare that in cases not included in the regulations adopted by them, populations and belligerents remain under the protection and empire of the principle of international law as they result from the usages established between civilized nations from the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. The last lines tell it all, the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. This is what is known as Martin Doctrine, without which we cannot actually establish where the world would be with the rapid increment in the military technology, especially since World War II. The question of the protection of civilians, especially when civilians take up arms to fight against the occupying forces, we have seen this of recent in the year 2022. The invasion of Ukraine by the Federation of Russia. And in this case, we are very clear that the government of Ukraine at some point decided to arm the civilians to protect the territory. But should they be considered as combatants or should they be considered as franc tire in French? This one brought a lot of discussions during the conference. However, still, the history can tell it. Martin's clause has informed the basis of the sources of the international humanitarian law and we are going to see this in a short while. Before we get there, it is very important to look at the divisive 
arguments among the humanitarian lawyers, international lawyers, as per what are the laws of humanity and requirements of public conscience. This kind of diversive debate among lawyers and law scholars at the international level brought three camps. One camp argues that Martin's clause serves the interpreter, in this case the judge, who uses it to ascertain certain informed perceptions. Camp number two deals with more radical position, whether Martin's clause is part and parcel of the treaty or it is part and parcel of the customary international humanitarian law. Martin's clause has been taken as part and parcel of the customs or the traditional practices by the states. We'll get there. Camp number three, however, admits that Martin's clause does not form the basis of the sources of international law and it is not a source of law in its own right, but it can form the basis for moral rules that states willingly can apply while considering hostilities and carrying out the conduct of war. But besides these kind of arguments, what is so important is the ruling of the International Court of Justice opinion. The majority of the judges ruled in favor of Martin's clause, which they cited adversely as follows. It has proved to be an effective means of addressing the rapid evolution of military technology. However, even this opinion of the court is the case law on the Martin's clause, but it doesn't provide us with the solution as per the interpretation of Martin's clause. Judge Koroma by then dissented and another judge dis dissented showing or indicating the difficulty in coming up with certain legal regulations at the international level or procedures that would ban the advancement in the military technology. But four points here are key to us and to our knowledge here. First, the way the court made clear reference to Martin's clause in 1996 when the petition was on the legality of the threat posed by the use of nuclear weapons. This is a question of the advisory opinion of the ICJ and in this case the opinion of the court became clear when the reference was made to Martin's Clause. And this is what eventually makes Martin's Clause a doctrine in the practice of the laws of armed conflict. Number two, in 1989, Hague Declaration on the legality of nuclear weapons, the question whether to use nuclear weapons or not. Another thing is whether to proceed in developing them. Remember the United Nations Convention of 1968 in prohibiting the production of nuclear weapons or stockpiling of such weapon of mass destruction and weapons that destroy 
both enemies and the civilians indiscriminately. Whereas number three puts Martin's clause into context. The additional protocol of 1977 to the Geneva Conventions had Martin's clause in the preamble at the draft level, but it was moved into the substantive provision of the treaty, and that is provision under Article 1, sub Article 2. Under Article 1, sub Article 2, there is a change from the laws of humanity to the principles of humanity and the change from the requirements of the public conscience to the dictates of the public conscience and Jean Pictet, the famous and world-renowned commentator, the one behind commentaries on the Geneva laws, approves that principles of humanity is a synonym to the laws of humanity, whereas the dictates of public conscience is a synonym to the requirements of public conscience that still upholds Martin's clause. Number four, we still understand that Martin's clause forms the basis of the customer international law as active norms that inform the states in their own conduct. And in that case, Martin's clause forms the basis of the doctrines and foundational concepts behind the laws of armed conflict. And this is our takeaway that Martin's clause as pronounced here is solidly understood as part and parcel of the entire international legal system. So those who do public international law and especially those who do the international humanitarian law must be aware and knowledgeable of this particular doctrine of which scholars, academics, practitioners, professionals make reference to at the international level. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. And I expect to see you soon in the other video. This is lecture 190. Bye for now.